Good morning. I'd like to call the October 25th, 2022 board meeting to order. Uh, the roll call indicate all commissioners are present. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, our first item would be to approve the agenda. Everyone should have it either electronically or on paper form in front of you. Any additions, corrections, comments? Otherwise, we look for a motion to approve the agenda. Move to approve the agenda. Thank you, Commissioner Mergen. Do we have a second? Second. Second that. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Persky. We have a motion and a second to approve the agenda. Any further discussion? Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried. Our next item is the public access forum. Anyone wishing to address the board on issues not found on today's agenda may do so at this time, either by attending the meeting in person or joining virtually. Individual comments are limited to three to four minutes. County board members will not engage in dialogue with speakers, but rather refer the matter to the appropriate county department. A citizen may speak at the public access forum only once per month. Is there anybody in virtual? Okay. So anyone here wishing to speak at the public access forum, please step up to the microphone, state your name and address, please. Uh, my name is Omar Abdullahi Pudi. I'm living in St. Cloud, Northside. Uh, my zip code 56303. Uh, I want to say about the election. Uh, here are a few points Minnesota value of freedom to have an equal say in decision that impact our lives. Keeping our elections safe and accessible for all is a key step in a building and a democracy that empowers everyone who makes Minnesota home, not individuals. Uh, uh, small but focal groups are undermining our democracy under the county level as part of our coordinated national efforts to undermine faith in our democracy. We stand with county level this election official who oversee our safe and accessible elections, no matter our color, background, or body. Uh, most Americans believe in free democracy where everyone have a voice. The January 6th hearing show uh, have shown that uh, have shown that there is a coordinated attack on our democracy happening across the country, and people willing to go to the violent extremists to carry it out. We stand united against anyone who continues to spread the big lie or deny our democracy rights. Whether we are casting ballots, speaking out at public, meeting or imagine in the streets, we must work together to protect the democratic institution we have, we have here so that we can empower everyone who makes Minnesota home, exercise the rights to vote in one way we activate our body as people. I believe that as a Somali American who came to the United States 17 years ago, have a right to cast his vote through, you know, a democratic way. Some people hesitating, ignoring, abusing, neglecting, and telling us that you are not belong to here. So we can accept that way. We are American, I'm a United States citizen. Some of you are here today, I vote for you for, for them. And I will be able to, st I, and I and I need to be able to vote still. So thanks for everyone here today, and have a great day. All right, thank you. Thank you, Omar. Anyone else wishing to speak at the public access forum? Please step up to the microphone, state your name and address, for the record. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Perla Ramos. I am with Unidos Minnesota and a community organizer for Fair and Justice, working in central Minnesota. I am one of the millions of immigrants um, with dreams and believe we can make the change if we do our part. Um, organizing and educating people in our communities, I have lived here in the United States for 23 years, <clears throat> I'm sorry, working hard and paying my taxes every year like everybody else. My husband and I have three kids, two, uh, two citizens, and one under the program of DACA. One of my daughters is 19 years old, and she will stand, she will stand for me and many others that can't vote this year. Hold on, okay. I have been involved in my community organizing for more than 10 years and hearing so many testimony, testimonies <coughs> from different people with the same purpose and same goals to become a citizen. My hope is to be able to be part of the change with the voice to vote. Right now, I have the opportunity to teach my community if they are a citizen to vote. I feel uh, teaching them who the candidates and which share supporting immigrants, working class, and climate represents the volumes I want for my family and my community and all the people. For the first year ever, I was able to be in a part and participate in the District Democ Democratic Caucus and the Regional Democratic Caucus. I helped me it helping me understand to see where even those who can vote still hold, hold power in this multiracial democracy, democratic democracy. I would like to say that I can understand my people continue to spread the big lie. No matter how many times in the states recounted there were no major changes in the border count. I wish to thank all those who work the day of election to keep it safe and secure. We must stand by those people because they are like you and me, doing a civic duty on our behalf. All votes are important. I also wish to thank the commissioners who have been strong not to be bent on our voting rules. We appreciate you standing with the, with the will of the people. Voting gives you a choice to decide which candidates favors your values, but it's up to us as a residents to hold them to their works and not be swayed by big corporations' money. Those are the ones who want to take, to take away our ability to vote and make it more difficult by placing walls. We can climb. We cannot allow this to happen. This is the reason I stand with We Choose Us Minnesota to defend the voting rights for fair voting in elections. Who stands with me in support for We Choose Us Minnesota? Raise their hands. Thank you. Is there anyone else here wishing to speak at the public access forum? Good morning. It's Andy Clocker, Avon. It's good to see everybody again. We have got finally a group here that wants to see um, a republic and a democracy and a fair vote. I hope you will listen to them, listen to all of us, so that we can make sure that their vote and my vote counts. I gave you the book today. We're going to go through a little bit of a history on the Constitution 101. On the cover of the booklet, it states the Constitution of the United States. It's the keepers. The only keepers are the people. We have got a group of people here that would like to be heard and represented. The booklet has an Amendment 14. You guys all took the oath to this Constitution, so I hope you did your homework and you know what you have, have signed up for 
of page 25 in your book, it says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process or law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. You signed your oaths. I have your oaths right here. I have Randy's oath as well. The Minnesota um, has the Bill, uh, the Bill of Rights, our Constitution, and the object of the government is to institute for the security, benefit, and the protection of the people, all the people, all mankind, in whom all political powers inherit together with the right to alter, modify, or reform government whenever required by the public good. The government serves, the government purpose is to secure our inalienable rights. That means our God-given rights that cannot be taken away. Our liberties. You took the oath of office, and when you did, you did sw solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the state of Minnesota to the best of my uh, ability and understanding. I hope you took that seriously. You made a promise to every U.S. citizen and the Stearns County. You signed a contract for, to protect our rights. You are not kings and queens. We don't live under rulers or dictators. We are not your subjects, servants, or slaves. Your titles do not give you rights over us. We, the people, have the power. You are indebted and obligated to us. As I watch actions in the community over the increased crime, street drugs, homelessness, tax burdens, the poor getting poorer, those that can't find food, you tax their heat. Grants that come from states and federal, that comes from our money. The money going into the school boards, they also took an oath. I don't think they are protecting the children. We have Attorney Kendall here today. She's going to talk about sex trafficking. I believe that a portion of those school books that we had talked about and in the library that have porn, talking about masturbation, anal sex, and things like that, is grooming and pimping our children. I, I'm, I, I, hope she will, I hope you will ask her how many children are being trafficked. The solution is not money. Handouts don't solve the problem. It only increases the debt and social welfare. You made a promise, an oath, a security to the benefit and the protection of the people. We are not the new world order. We will not live under the, the economic forum sustainable goal plans. I'm guessing maybe you got your training from Sourcewell or the League of Cities. What are we going to say, the Pledge of Allegiance? We can't even say freedom. We're going to say the Pledge of Allegiance or the Pledge of Alliance. Virgil Fuchs, $95,000 assessment, and you tell him to sit down. I'm almost done, Steve. That's a violation of his property rights, and I see it as elder abuse and criminal. Not constitutional, shall deprive any person of their liberty or, or property. Cameras in our homes and our private residences. Do we need babysitters and the neighbors babysitting the babysitters? This is Orwellian. I'm going to send you the movie, the George Orwell 1984 movie. I have, many, I have heard time and time again that the elections are 100% accurate. These people want a fair election. We want a fair election. We deserve a fair election. And we are not saying that people cannot vote. I know you want to shut me off. I got to play one thing here. Well, your time is up, Sandy. Yeah, actually, do a scientific audit, and maybe that's the difference of terminology. Okay. Instead of say forensic, let's do a scientific audit of. And I actually had an agreement with Sandy, Simon time. at the committee level when he actually admitted that there was fraud. He actually admitted there was fraud. So either our Secretary of State Simon is admitting that there is fraud or our state senator is lying. I have much more Thank I you. would like to say, and I would like to see that we hang on to um, our election, and it is our property, and I would like you to start hearing us and these people. Thank, Thank you. you.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Fabiola Velasquez, and I work for Unidos Minnesota as a community organizer. First, I would like to start by saying that I'm from Venezuela, a country in South America that has a very bad political situation. One of the predominant reasons why millions of Venezuelans like me have left the country is because there is not a transparent electoral system anymore. Now, we have a corrupt government that has been perpetuated in power for more than 20 years. So after years and years of people manipulating the process of elections, um, and the results of the elections, my people lost their trust and the consequences were high because they stopped voting. They knew that their voices were not here anymore. We lost our democracy and that is the first step to the collapse of a country. So I know what is at stake for me. And for this reason, it is important for me that this state and my community where I have lived, studied and worked since I and work hard since I was 16 years old, have a democracy that represents us all. That is why my self-interest is to create political education in my community to create independent political power. Based on this, since the beginning of the summer, we have been knocking on doors, registering new voters, having deep conversations, and bringing all the necessary information about the voting process to our community. This means that it's not only me doing my job, my community is working hard and is doing its part because we want everyone's voices to be heard. And for, this re and for this to happen, we are clear that we must maintain our voting machines as they have been proven to be the safest and most accurate process for counting votes. Thank you all. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else wishing to speak? Please state your name and address for the record. Thank All you. Right. My name is Mohammed, and I live in Wake Park. Uh, I've graduated from St. Cloud State. I'm a student here. I've been here for, for quite a time. Uh, today, I'm here uh, with a concerned neighbors in, in Stearns County uh, because I know that has been a group of sh people showing up at county board commissions for the last few months and uh, basically trying to undermine the democracy. And they're, they're asking for things like switching from our trusted um, system and, and to hand counting and limiting the drop boxes locations and also making false claims of a fraud and irregularities in our, in our election as well. Uh, the request the requests that coming from them is very dangerous. Um, if you look at a third world countries, this is how it starts to country to go down. Uh, they also um, they also part of a national and coordinated um, a big lie attack on the dem a democracy as well. Um, just because a, a candidate didn't win, this shouldn't be an issue at all, and people shouldn't go this far at all. Um, we try to, uh, they're trying to limit the freedom of, of a choice and the freedom of a limit of a voting, particularly people of a color from uh, voting, uh, because they know that we are powerful together. When we come together, the people of color and color people, when they come together, that creates a huge power, which makes the other side of, to double down and do whatever they have to do. Uh, we also know that Minnesotans trust the election process also, and we also know we have a very high uh, vote, uh, vote, uh, vote turnover in the nation. And also in a place like St. Cloud, with the growing diversity, we should be the most concerned about that our, election, that our elections are welcoming and accessible rather than um, see these false claims of irregularities and of fraud. And also the spread of misinformation and the harassment of election officials and the bullying of a county commission uh, members that we have seen from around the world or around the nation. Uh, we, won't, we won't stand for it and we know our elections are free, fair and secure. We also know that our voices matter and that our voices should count and we should continue working with you and the nonpartisan election members that are working towards this goal. Thank you guys so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Mark Morris, uh, Sartell, Minnesota, 671 Roberts Road, apartment 204. Uh, like I said, I'll reiterate uh, Eric von Mecklen's book about, uh, about 
why, why, are, why are we not using the CAS boat records to, to, check, to check the validity of, the, of uh, the elections and stuff to see what it is and the price? Like I said before, it does not cost $50,000 to have it done. You can, do a so you can do something with the software inside, inside the machines. So if you really, if we really want to have true transparency and, a f and good, fair elections, we're going to have that to be able to do that is to check that and verify it. And also, I know that I know that uh, State Secretary of State Steve Simon changed rules back in 2020 to give more time for for uh, mail in balloting. And all that, and that's a huge, a huge problem when you have 46 days ahead of time for for elections. That's really unacceptable. You should only have like a, a couple days ahead of time for the elections. There's no no reason to have that much time in between because of that. Because what is what he also he did is he removed witness requirements for male male voters in the primary. He extended the deadline to accept mail ballots two days and a stipulation of partial de consent decree he also uh, changed that with uh, the LaRose order CV 20 31 49 order on July 31st uh, and he removed witness requirements for mail and voters in general and extended the deadline like I said to accept mail ballots seven days uh, Thank you for your time, uh, commissioners. That's all I have to say. I just like to see, I just like to add one more time, one more thing that uh, I'd like to see what you guys are gonna do about that, or if you can change some things here in this election. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Anyone else wishing to speak today at the public access forum? Anyone else wishing to speak? Thank you for all you're doing for us, serving us. I'm Father Tony Kroll. I love Minnesota, and I understand that Minnesota is, has a good percentage of voters. I love democracy, and I think the more we can keep this democracy going, we can be leading the other states also. So let's do what we can to keep kind of this um, prize that we have, Minnesota leading other states in the most number of voters, percentage of voters. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anybody else wishing to speak at today's public access forum? Anyone else wishing to speak? Last call. All right, seeing no one else, uh, thank you for everyone for your comments today. We will move on to our next item, which is the consent agenda, which should be in front of everyone here. And I don't, there might be some copies in the back of the room as well. So if everybody's had a chance to review those, uh, either a motion to accept them as they're presented. So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Clark. You get a second. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Persky. Any further discussion on the consent agenda items? Any further discussion? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Next item is the attorney. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Janelle Kennell. I am the Stearns County attorney, and we are glad to be invited here today to talk about our work on sex trafficking. As this commission knows, because you've been there every step of the way, uh, when this first started, we had a drive-by shooting in Waite Park and found out that a young girl from Aiken County was being sold in a hotel there, and the person who had bought her was not following the pimp's rules, and there was literally a drive-by shooting in a public hotel uh, space. So from that time on, we started digging into what's actually going on in Stearns County. We have had a task force in place that has been funded since 2018. And today what we want to do is start by showing you the educational video that we recently uh, 
represented, uh, created by the task force. Um, we're going to talk a little bit after that about who exactly is in the task force, what the numbers are, and provide you the data to back up what we're showing here in this video. But this is an educational video that the, we want the community to see, and we very much appreciate being able to have this time to do that, as to what's, uh, what's really going on out there and how the average person can help. So first today we'll show the video, and then with me today I have Muriel Lester, the Assistant Chief of my Criminal Division, who's been trying these cases since they first came to our attention, as I say, back in 2014 and before. I also have Investigator Trent Fisher from the St. Cloud Police Department. He has been a full-time sex trafficking investigator since 2018. So he's going to be able to answer some questions on what he's seeing out there. And I also have Heather Benhardis, the data analyst in my office, who has been looking at the phone dumps, going through all the data, all the investigations, again, since that time. So we have three people who have put a lot, lot of time and effort into working specifically on these cases that we'll have um, with some data and some question and answers afterwards. But first, we would like to show you this video. This is an issue of people using people, of trafficking people uh, to, to make money for themselves. So many people think that it's just a big city problem and um, they don't realize that it's happening all around them in small towns and in large communities. Sex trafficking or prostitution is happening in Stearns County. We have software that kind of collects all the advertisements on multiple different websites. We find that outside of Minneapolis, St. Paul, St. Cloud is probably the number one area in our state. The access to pornography that's available on the internet has fueled a lot of this. The word violent, when you say that, that is the word that um, best describes what is happening to these victims. It's pure violence. Hundreds of thousands of dollars is being made by trafficking women. More and more youth are being targeted. And their ultimate goal is to meet up and have sex with that juvenile. This is about money. This is about profit. This is about drugs. And this is about selling people like you'd order something at Target. It's beyond our expectations. We started to doing some uh, basic investigations, um, really wanted to try to assess the scope of the problem. And I had gotten a call from the State Human Trafficking Task Force that they had recovered a 16-year-old juvenile female out of the runaway out of the Twin Cities in our city. When we first had a drive-by shooting outside a hotel in Wake Park and realized that there was a teenage girl being sold inside and the fight was about how the buyer had not followed the trafficker's rules with this particular girl, uh, we started to look at what was really going on in the shadows of the community. And so we started to do a series of knock and talks at this local motel where we just knock on the door. We, we, we started looking at some of the social media websites that existed back at the time. There were 15 to 20 women that had posted ads. That was obviously got our attention. It had been there all along, but we didn't know until we opened our eyes to the reality of it. After that, we thought, well, what's the demand for this? And so we set up a fake ad of our own, and we tied it to a cell phone number. And within 24 hours, we had 75 phone calls to that, that fake ad, to that, that cell phone. And so that told us, or told me, that we have a, a problem. In 2014-15, I was in charge of the Central Minnesota Violent Offender Task Force, and I was tasked with, uh, by the sheriffs at the time and the police chiefs, to kind of work on it for a summer. We probably identified 61 victims of, uh, of uh, sex trafficking. And so it was kind of an eye-opener for, I think, all the uh, chief law enforcement people at the time. When they hear the word sex trafficking, people think different things. Some people think that their child is going to get stolen from the mall and be taken into a sex trafficking ring, and they're not looking at what the real issue in central Minnesota and in Minnesota really is, um, which is a lot bigger than that. There's a lot more things to be concerned about than that. It's what your children are looking at on social media, who they're speaking with. Sex trafficking really uh, preys on our most vulnerable victims in any community. 
Uh, it preys on our youth. It preys on those who are already dealing with other struggles. Um, and the most critical thing about it is that it kind of flies under the radar of what traditional law enforcement sees. When you're talking about selling multiple persons multiple times a day, the amount of money that's been made is why we're having a hard time getting to some of those bigger traffickers. This is big money. And the persons who are going to have to testify to hold you criminally accountable you know what you've put them through and you know what they've been through and you know that that manipulation is why they're in the life. So your chances of getting caught, that cost-benefit analysis, that's why they keep it up. So many people think that it's just a big city problem and um, they don't realize that it's happening all around them in small towns and in large communities. And so we know there are victims throughout the state of Minnesota in all areas of Minnesota. And so it's a very large problem. That's the way it is in our country. Um, and so, yes, it's a very big problem. So the legal definition of sex trafficking is um, pretty broad. It has four different areas that you can prosecute in. One is that somebody engages in sex trafficking. One is that somebody receives profits of prostitution. One is that somebody promotes the prostitution of an individual. The fourth one is that somebody solicits or induces prostitution. Sex trafficking or human trafficking, which combines both labor and sex, is actually the second largest criminal enterprise in the world, usually falling just under um, drugs. And so we know that, like drugs, that happen everywhere. You don't get to be that large of a criminal enterprise without happening everywhere as well. We actually found that central Minnesota or east central Minnesota, which includes St. Cloud and surrounding counties, had one of the highest percentages of self-disclosures from youth, higher than either metro region. This is different than prostitution. This is an issue of people using people, of trafficking people uh, to, to make money for themselves, to, to profit for themselves at, at total expense of the victim. Human trafficking is, is exactly like drug dealing except for you have a human being you're exchanging a human being uh, or a life for money a more common term sort of out of date term is a pimp is what a sex trafficker would be we refer to them as sex traffickers so it's someone that's receiving profit or promoting the prostitution of a victim <laughs> The Central Minnesota Human Trafficking Task Force actually started when we realized that this was going on in our community. Our main goal was to, to go after the traffickers. There were these, these mostly men that were trafficking women, making huge amounts of money. When we started the Central Minnesota Human Trafficking Task Force, we knew that law enforcement couldn't be the only piece. Law enforcement is kind of the end of the road that we needed to get to the beginning of the road of how is this happening to begin with. Mm -hmm. And then once we found victims, how do we help them back out of the life? We can prosecute the trafficker, we can put him in prison, mm -hmm. but her life and her experiences are there. So here we have a multidisciplinary team that really is, is really robust. We have social services including, you know, um, child protection, child welfare, probation, um, we have Terebinth Refuge, which serves adult women. We have our LSS programs, our Lutheran Social Service programs, including My Safe Harbor programs. Uh, we have the shelters included in that for the homeless shelters or um, warming centers. We have Centra Care for health care included, law enforcement from multiple jurisdictions, the county attorney's office, the city's attorney's office. Um, we have people represented from Benton County, Stearns County. Our task force also does take on the cases where a parent calls up and says, I found that my daughter was sending nude photos to somebody and I don't know who and if they're an adult and where they live. And so some of our resources go to electronic solicitation of a minor, um, which is a really big piece of the task force as well. We have a high-risk runaway program, so there's certain criteria that will flag a child runs away three or more times. And so now we have uh, state grant funding that will allow us to uh, staff uh, three investigators. So in our task force we have, we will have the three investigators, data analysts, victim assistance coordinator and the prosecutor. This task force that's funded in central Minnesota to investigate trafficking and prosecute trafficking crimes is also putting forth um, funds, time, resources to create educational material to go out and educate the community.
there's some common myths that are really promoted by our media and as well as social media um, where we find that people really think that this is an issue of kidnapping and abduction. But really what it is, is it's relationships that are formed between an exploiter and a victim or a trafficker and a victim. And there's a grooming process that takes place. The victims look like anyone else in the community. We find people that are looking for a way out, that are easily manipulated. Commonly we see persons who have experienced some sort of trauma in their life and then this manipulative person comes in and says, I can make your life better. You're beautiful, you're valuable, and gives them something within themselves that's not there. One thing that is always kind of shocking to me, or makes me sad, I guess I would say, is the way that these victims see themselves. Like they generally seem to have no self-worth. You know, they refer to themselves in derogatory terms. Almost all of them have some sort of chemical dependency we find where they're addicted to, to drugs mostly, sometimes alcohol or a combination of the two. We get a lot of single moms that are trying to make money for their family or got roped into this is the only way they can make money to support their kids. Once she is in the life, getting back out is going to cost something. And the amount of violence that we see, that was one of the, the early things that we found is actually victims that had been severely beaten. And so a victim can be majority women and girls, but there are also boys and men that are trafficked and exploited as well. Some of them, um, of these boys and men, might be transgender folks or LBGTQ folks that have been pushed out of their home society and um, they are vulnerable. All ages, younger children um, are exploited and trafficked and all the way up to adults who have been in this for years and have not been able to find a way to get out. The idea that they can just walk away, it's just so much more complicated than that. The traffickers, the people who are actually getting people into the life so that they can then profit from them, are criminals career criminals. They have a history of selling narcotics, running guns. They found that trafficking women is another way to make money. The sex trafficker usually is a boyfriend. Um, I, there isn't a specific race, there isn't a specific age. It is in the 20s to 50s. And then at some point usually there's kind of a seed planted you know, about making some extra money. It's always this promise of them building a life together, even though the, the victim is the only one that has to do the prostitution or, or you know, sac make sacrifices in that regard. We also know there is a significant amount of familial trafficking happening um, within our state as well. So familial trafficking means that if a parent or a caregiver or something with, within that um, family unit that is trafficking and exploiting them. Sometimes the trafficker is the one who, it, just because of the relationship dynamics, is in charge of all of the money, even if they're not the one making the money. A lot of these cases intersect with domestic violence, where there's already a power differential, where the boyfriend or the person that they've had children with is just in charge of everything. In every case I've worked someone that's close to them that had a relationship to the victim and manipulated them into this lifestyle through some means whether it's through force or fraud or coercion it's almost <laughs> always there with someone who's close to them. Some of these people that I prosecute for sex trafficking now five ten years ago I was prosecuting them for domestic violence and domestic assaults and I had no idea at that time uh, nor was there evidence out there that sex trafficking was happening. But when you combine those two dynamics, you don't need a lot more to convince somebody to make money for the family when the alternative might be that they will be assaulted. And there's violence associated with it because oftentimes the individuals that are conducting sex trafficking are, are finding ways to keep their victims from reporting, keep their victims dependent on them. But we'll interview victims that they have sex assaults like rapes and assaults that they didn't report to law enforcement at the time because they felt like they couldn't. There was nobody they could have talked to because they felt like they would get in trouble. That after the fact you learn they've been assaulted multiple times by both buyers and traffickers. That they've been raped by buyers and traffickers. 
but for the most part, they are beholden to anything they need and want from the trafficker. Mm -hmm. In central Minnesota, as well as around the whole state, buyers are predominantly middle-aged men, married men, with families, middle class. Sometimes we see people coming from another area to this area because we have more ads here than in some of the smaller towns. But they're married, employed men with children who are doing this on their lunch breaks on the way home from work. Sex buyers in central Minnesota can range from any age, 18 to 70 something. You know, we've had all across the board, any race, um, it really does, it has no boundaries. You never know who's going to show up. The sex trafficking in central Minnesota is in the hotels and motels, although now we've trained all of those staff in what to look for, and they do call and they do report. So we're seeing more of it in apartments, in houses. Uh, literally one of the traffickers that we had um, offered up his house in exchange for sex. You can use my place. Rather than getting cash for it, he charged sex for it. Uh, buyers are connecting with victims through um, online ads, and there's various um, platforms for that. Uh, Mega Personals, um, Skip the Games, um, List Crawler. I, I could go on and on and on. There's too many to count, really. And then a lot of times they meet on something, something like that, but then somebody will say, you know, here's my Snapchat name, you know, add me to Snapchat and then we'll communicate through that or a phone number or whatever other means. So it's kind of a, a they initiate the conversation there and then they quickly move it to another platform where they can kind of have one-on-one -on -one direct communication. There's also other things too that we've come across where the victim may have like a Twitter page or an Instagram account um, and I think information on there leads these uh, buyers to believe they may be able to meet someone that way, so they may contact a victim through those platforms as well that are maybe more mainstream. The access to pornography that's available on the internet has fueled a lot of this. What I had an officer say to me is that um, not everyone who watches porn buys a woman, but this officer said every buyer that I've, I've gotten and talked to, they were in porn, had been addicted or had used porn. And so it really changes and shifts the brain, it causes an addiction, and then they're wanting to more and more and more and more and eventually buying someone to fulfill the fantasies they see in the pornography. Most buyers are repeat buyers. Um, when I go through phone downloads and other information, I'll see oftentimes just the way that a buyer is talking to a victim. I'll think, I, I, I think I've heard this guy before. I, I think I know who this might be. The buyers are spending a lot of money on this for each individual transaction. We s frequently see as much as 100, 200, 300 bucks to meet up with someone to have sex for time increments as low as 15 minutes, 30 minutes. It's not infrequent to see people spend, you know, three, four hundred dollars in one sitting just to have sex with somebody. In this day and age, so much of it is done online. The traffickers are different than the persons who are seeing soliciting kids for sex, which is different. They are looking for vulnerable children that are on different um, chat rooms, um, online spaces, and they are looking for children that are saying, oh, my life sucks and things aren't going good for me, my parents don't understand, I'm bullied at school, no one understands me. Um, someone who's looking for friendship, companionship, a boyfriend because maybe all their girlfriends at school has boyfriends. And what they'll typically do, it's called a grooming process. They'll introduce themselves typically as the same age or roughly the same age as the, as the boy or girl they're texting with. And they'll basically just start in a relationship that looks pretty normal as you first start reading the conversation. But it'll turn into a lot of times they'll ask for a naked photograph or something like that. And then once they get that, they kind of got their hooks into them and they'll use that as blackmail saying that we're going to blast this out on your social media account to all your friends and then they keep getting more photos, more photos. I think the men that are soliciting these juveniles, for the most part what I've seen at least to date is they're looking for a sexual relationship for themselves, a sex act. I, we have not come across yet where we've seen them locate this juvenile victim and then turn them into a victim as far as sex trafficking goes. We do a lot of work on chat rooms that a lot of these guys will go on the internet 
specifically seeking out how to have sex with kids and they try to hide it really well. They'll create fake social media profiles, fake email accounts, a whole fake alter ego in some cases. They'll have a different name, they'll have addresses they give that aren't even real, and they will go to the end of the world to cover their tracks. A lot of it has shifted to chatting. Criminal enterprises get smarter and smarter as we as systems get smarter and smarter. So we find that a lot of people will maybe have ongoing chat conversations, especially prior to purchasing a minor. So there might be chatting that starts up once people in the household go back to bed. And sometimes people will think, well, I've got to, I've got to, I can see what my kids are doing on the computer, so I know they're not doing that. Well, then it's on their phone. We actually had one that went through the Xbox figured out that that was one of the places when the kids are playing video games that they could actually break in when they were playing the video games with other people online and that was where they would find the type of person that they were looking to invite and to engage in this type of conversation. But in like Snapchat too, you know, there's a feature on there called Quick Add and you can just go down and add people and a lot of people just accept it and we've had cases where that's how they are getting contacted too, you know, especially youth. We place advertisements online to, to combat some of the trafficking, the demand in our area. But we have accounts on all these websites. You'll never know when it's us posting because we change them pretty frequently. We talk about solicitation of kids on the internet. Most often we see it starting on these internet chat rooms. This is one that we get a lot of traffic on. You can see there's 43,000 people logged into this chat room right now. It has that on the upper right hand corner. And they'll give you a way to kind of narrow down who you're talking to. There's an interest box in here. So I put in Minnesota. And this will connect me with other people who put Minnesota in their interest box, which is most oftentimes what these guys or people who are looking to meet up on this website will do. There's no login, there's no Anything that would prevent a 10-year-old kid from clicking Minnesota, hitting text, and there you are. You'll go to start chatting, and it will just start randomly connecting you with people who also like Minnesota, and they'll start talking. Oftentimes, they'll start with their age, their sex, and their location. So this guy says he's a male and 16 years old. Most oftentimes, they'll lie and they'll tell you that they're 16 or 17. We've had that a lot where guys will come on here and say they're 17. They're in their mid-30s. Most of the people who are on here are on here to have sex. Um, we don't bring up that we're here trying to have sex with people. They bring it up first. And I've, I've found that when I do these, if I sit down for a day and just work on these, I can usually find somebody every day. So he told me he's from Prior Lake and he's a 16-year-old male. Like I said, you can put any age that you want on here. You can just say what you are. Obviously, I'm saying I'm a 15-year-old female. They make it pretty clear that they want to meet for sex because these people don't want to drive all the way to St. Cloud if they don't know for sure that they're going to get to have sex. So oftentimes they'll ask here, what brings you on here? And that's where they're looking for you to say, oh, I'm on here trying to have sex. I don't tell people that. I make them bring it up first. He asks, what brings you on here? Same as you, probably. What is everyone on here for? Sex. So this guy told me he's an 18-year-old male from Apple Valley and is already talking about sex with a 15-year-old girl he met from St. Cloud on the internet. That's how quick that was. Uh, he asked if I was a virgin, and I said I wouldn't come on here if I was, and he said he's a virgin. Yeah, so what will happen at some point on here, because this is all anonymous, it might be a phone number, it might be a Snapchat, it might be an email, and then we have ways of identifying these people, because everything on these websites is anonymous. And... But it's funny because this guy says he's an 18-year-old, which would be a high school senior who's in school right now, who's on an internet chat room talking about sex with a 15-year-old. He used to end up in St. Cloud, but I don't know who he is yet. So, Even him asking if I'm here to have sex and asking if I'm a virgin when he knows that I'm a 15-year-old female, the, the solicitation of a child statute says describing or discussing sexual conduct, which... We would probably want more than this, and if we sat here long enough, we would get more than this. Now he's asking to meet up. So he just asked, uh, have a friend drive me down to Apple Valley or get driven up one night? What have we been doing this for five minutes? We already have an 18-year-old who wants to meet up with a 15-year-old to have sex. He just said that he would take a lift up here, so he's willing to take a, a rideshare service up, then smash, then down. I would bet that there's probably... If you're just talking internet chat rooms, hundreds of them that you could sign on to and use. If I was solely dedicating nothing but my time to doing these chat rooms and solicitation, I would never run out of work to do. 
I, I could sit on here all day and every single day I would find new people who are on the internet trying to solicit kids for sex. It would never run out. But now that this guy is disconnected, we'll have to get him a different time. And you can just start a new one. And it works just like that. Male 16. As a parent, the biggest thing I can say to prevent your, your child from you know, getting involved with some of these people online and things like that, because that's predominantly what we see in the juveniles is the online communication, is just to really be up on the different accounts, the different social media things, you know, the trends. Parents, uh, get a little bit intrusive into your kids' uh, lives, uh, ask questions, uh, get on the phones and, uh, and, and kind of, you know, check what, what they're, who they're communicating with, what they're looking at, those type of things. What I tell parents, guardians, caretakers to look for are changes to normal behavior, changes to normal peer groups. Um, again, these trafficking situations very rarely involve kidnapping and abduction. So we can usually see signs of unhealthy relationships starting to form. So it's not only important for kids and young people to know red flags of unhealthy people and unhealthy relationships, but it's good for parents to see that as well. Be aware that there are people out there looking to manipulate kids and, and literally bank on that. One of the victims told us that the first time that she realized there was something outside Stearns County that she could get involved in, she was 13 years old and she was skiing at Powder Ridge. And she was on the ski lift with this 20-some year old guy and they got to talking on the ski lift and she'd never had marijuana before. He offered her marijuana. That was how it started of, hey, you know, you're a pretty girl, you're beautiful. I've got these things, hey, we should talk. And one thing led to another, but it was literally as simple as riding on a ski lift and seeing the opportunity. And that manipulation and that opportunistic quality of attracting people um, into this life is something that we see as, as basic as that. Awareness of who their children are hanging out with. If, if one day you knew or know who your kids' friends are in the, in the next month you don't, that, that should be a concern. They're coming home with gifts that, or clothing or whatever that you didn't buy uh, and they really don't have the money to purchase themselves, that should be a red flag. So I always tell parents, be aware of what your kids are doing on the internet, what they're doing on social media. And the best way you can do that sometimes is just be involved with it. We've had cases that started over video games. Maybe play video games with your kids. Uh, a lot of cases happen over Facebook. Check your kid's Facebook. I highly recommend getting some kind of app that will monitor what uh, apps and stuff they download. Like there's, you know, Life360 will track the phone. You know, there's different things um, that are kind of preventative measures that they can get to at least keep an eye. You can shut down their phone at night so they're not in the middle of the night texting with somebody. You know, just things like that. I've never interviewed a parent that wished they gave their kid more privacy on the internet and more privacy on a cell phone after the fact when they've been a victim of something. I've only heard the opposite, that they wish they had been more involved, they wish that they had asked more questions. It's never been the other way around. People in the general public can watch and they can listen and they can pay attention and they can call. We have had 350 calls. Dispatchers know when those calls come in where to put those, who to get them to. Then we can start looking for specific things um, in relation to what you're calling about. One thing that community can do is to you know, really pay attention to when they're responding in a victim blaming matter. Um, unfortunately, I see victim blaming really embedded in our communities and it makes for those that have experienced victimization to feel like they, they can't come forward, they can't share their story, they can't ask for assistance. It's the community being aware that this can happen anywhere, that it can happen here in St. <clears throat> Cloud, um, and that we need people to make sure that they understand what that might look like and, and where to go if they have concerns that somebody might be affected by this. And so in being aware then you can educate others and then you can also know when it's important to call law enforcement and say, hey, I think something's going on at my neighbor's house or going on here or there. Um, should never intervene yourself, but make that call. It's really getting everyone on board with showing versus telling us what we can really get to.
We need to warn our children. We need to give them um, the tools to know how to deal with online predators or someone who approaches them uh, that way and to ha understand what these people are, what they're looking for and what they're doing. <coughs> St. Cloud area in particular is, is really lucky because there's a vast number of resources here. Um, there's Catholic Charities, so there's uh, the Youth House and they have other outreach programs. We have a drop-in center here with Pathways for Youth, Terebinth Refuge which, which serves adult women. Um, we have 180 Degrees which serves minors of um, all demographics, so girls, boys, trans youth, LGBTQ plus youth, and there's you know Hope Housing, and there's um, there's all these programs, TriCap, the Regional Navigator, um, Supportive Services through Central Minnesota Sexual Assault Center, um, Anna Marie. So really, Saint Cloud is a great place with a wealth of resources. The Center Cares Child Advocacy Center has been again an unexpected partner in this, having people who have trauma-informed um, interview abilities that are able to do the medical exams, that are able to get us hooked up with the mental health services. It's critical when it happens. The Sexual Assault Center operates the John School for a class called Men Accountable for Sexual Exploitation. That is a one-day class that costs, I think, $750, and that's where the individuals then go and learn about what sex trafficking is. You know, I, I believe our, our task force will come out and do a training for just about anybody. I believe they've done taxi cab drivers in the past, the, the Metro bus here in St. Cloud, bus drivers is a, another good uh, uh, you know, mode of transportation that they could maybe identify something, uh, hotel clerks. In central Minnesota, we actually have a safe place where victims of sex trafficking can go and to be in a place where there's going to be a warm bed, where there's going to be food, but most importantly, people who understand what's going on here. And having CeCe and the staff there at Terebinth Refuge has been invaluable. I don't know that we would be anywhere close to what we've accomplished so far without CeCe being here from the very beginning. Terebinth Refuge is a Christ-centered shelter and safe home and <laughs> hope and healing services to women who have been sexually exploited and trafficked. And so we provide holistic services to the women that come to our shelter. Uh, we have four phases in our program uh, in which they come in, they have case management to really look at them individually and what are their goals and their needs. We provide holistic healing, so how we frame that is body, mind, soul, and spirit healing in all of those areas. As Terabith has evolved, from initially kind of a crisis bed, if you will, to now they have a house that is helping women transition out of. It's just been an amazing story. Since we started in April of 2018, we are at about 121 women that have been served um, over this time. And um, as we've grown and really strengthened our program, we have seen more and more women being able to go through all of the phases and move into their own apartments. It's always a huge, um, wonderful thing when we can help a woman get an apartment and help get furniture and those starting things. Um, and they're working and um, really doing well. And so we've seen quite a few um, successes that way, and it's just, that's what we want. We want a woman to leave us knowing she's competent in, in making a way in this world in the areas that she's interested in. Let me show you what we mean by the actual numbers that we've seen here in Stearns County. Um, the video is made with uh, forfeiture dollars. Um, there are also some penalties that are assessed on the people that we've convicted of these type of crimes. So this is what the um, prevention work that 
that we're talking about goes for. Here's what we've seen so far. And these are updated through our most recent um, grant report. We do those quarterly. Um, Commissioner Persky actually kind of accidentally ended up in one of the very first meetings of the task force, and he's been there the whole time, so I know he's aware of these numbers and what we're seeing. Um, these are the actual number of charges that we've had to, that we've been able to uh, prove. Um, again, 39 traffickers so far, 19 soliciting kids online, as Investigator Wanderscheid says there, you can basically do this all day long. Um, I've actually referred to the buying is probably about as common as speeding. Um, just as many people as we have out there to, to catch them, we're going to find that. The CSC3 there is a criminal sexual conduct case against a person who did contact a teenager online and did meet up with her and did force her to have sex with him, so we have seen that. There's the number of victims that we have, as you see the number of um, adults versus juveniles. Juveniles are harder to find. They're less likely to think that they can dare to speak up, and even if we do locate them, the chances that they disappear again pretty quickly are, um, are higher. And our sex buyers, again, we'll, we'll break this down a little bit in terms of the different ways that we go about handling this. Here's the task force, and many of them are in the room today, the sheriff's here. Um, Jeff Oxton, now about to be our chief of police, he's been here from the beginning. Dave Bentrude actually started this chief of police in Wake Park with that drive-by. And the St. Cloud City Attorney's Office has ended up playing a very critical role in shutting down the massage parlors. So we'll talk about that a little bit. The BCA is on board. Obviously, we've got a couple investigators that are housed here at our sheriff's office, um, and they help us with the phone dumps and the, uh, the analysis as well. A lot of victim advocacy groups. As you saw in the video, we have the only adult um, refuge in the state of Minnesota for these victims. Mid Minnesota Legal Aid jumping in to help out those folks and things that we can't do in the criminal justice system. And obviously all of the, the other um, services agencies that are here as part of the county and part of the community. We have gone out and done a fair amount of training with this and we've got a lot ahead. We purposely did this video with the idea that we'll take this to the schools, we'll take this to the community organizations. And what we saw during COVID, at the beginning we thought, you know, how can grannies help us? Well, grannies are home and grannies see what goes on in the neighborhood and they see when there are people going back and forth over the lunch hour. As we see in the video, this is not happening in the middle of the night on the weekend. This is happening in broad daylight <coughs> as people are going back and forth to work and, and arranging these meetups at that time. So we have been out to schools, we've been out to churches, um, as you see in the video. Uh, the people who <coughs> drive for a living and are out and around the community, the UPS drivers, uh, postal carriers, they see a lot of things. Stearns Electric, those electricians, again, what they're seeing is they're out and about doing their job um, during the day um, and what they can do to help us. And recently now the Rotary, and we got this to a really critical group of people at District 742. So we've got a whole bunch of those scheduled, and that's one of the reasons we're doing this today, to let people know that they just need to reach out to one of these agencies, and we'll get you a group of people out to talk about what's really going on. Again, these are very current, um, as of just a little over a week ago was our last uh, grant report. So we've had 393 referrals. Some of those are from people calling in. Some of those are from what law enforcement sees during a traffic stop. Um, the amount of this that, that we find just in random traffic stops where we're pulling people over for whatever reason we're supposed <coughs> to be pulling people over, and then voila, here's what we have. Um, early on, in fact, we found a couple young girls out in the middle of the county about 7 o'clock in the morning. What are these two young girls doing in the back seat? With, what's going on here? Um, so just in the normal course of law enforcement, when you have your eyes open to what you uh, might find, um, we've, really, we've really come across a lot. Just that was there all along. We just weren't looking for it and didn't know what we were seeing. 133 sex buyers so far. There's a lot more in the system right now. Again, um, that's just a matter of how many hours you want to put into into setting up those fake ads because people <laughs> will answer them. And we do now have a number of people that we have caught in this community more than once. So when you look at who those victims are um, in Terebinth Refuge, those are through 2021. So actually what CC talks about in the video will be even more updated uh, numbers there on the amount of victims that they have served. And they have continued, as she said, to expand to not only being a crisis bed, but somewhere where people can get stabilized can get work, can get their GEDs, um, can get to where they'd like to be in life. And those high-risk runaways, not surprisingly, since the dawn of time, um, what do you suppose happens when a young girl runs away and has nowhere to stay and no food and from the dawn of time? And when we say exploited, 
This is one of the things I had to ask the investigators at one point. You keep talking about sexual exploitation. What do you mean by that? Trading sex for anything. Trading sex for shelter, for money, for food, for trading sex for that. And that was the thing that um, Kate LePage, the, the regional navigator, talks about that there have actually been across the state. We have not came across one of these so far, but where we have actually parents or caregivers then trading that for things that the family needs. Um, and as the investigators say, we have came across single parents that are in that situation. But what we see and what we know is out there and what we've actually came across in cases in Stearns County, we can differentiate for you. And that's why I have the person who does all the data dumps, she's the data analysis, she's here. Um, Trent Fisher has been doing nothing but this since 2018. And Muriel has had a hand in prosecuting all of these cases. So those persons are here. We had to get the law caught up. I tell you what, was that a mess? Um, when we started it, they were still talking about persons on street corners and Hennepin Avenue and that sort of stereotype of what Minnesotans think of when they think of prostitution. Um, what's actually going on now, as we see in the video, we see every single day, people are ordering up humans on their phone. You order it up like you would order something delivered from Target. And we found that the people that we are catching are the longtime criminals. As Chief Ventured says in the video, these people sell drugs, they sell people, they sell guns, um, and many of them already have criminal histories as long as you're armed. This is just another way to make money. There's a lot, lot of money in this. The risk of getting drugs and selling them and getting caught and what happens when that all goes down um, is higher risk, frankly, than having this renewable resource that they can sell multiple times a day. So really a lot of money. And many of these people, by the time we catch them, we'll show you what those prison sentences look like because they already have a long criminal history. And now when we can prove this beyond a reasonable doubt, that means a lot of time in prison. We also have people that we're just catching for the first time. That solicitation of children that happens on those chat lines that we see, um, those people were even the maximum sentence for that was only three years at the beginning. Those people do not tend to have long criminal histories. They've been doing this for a long time. They've never been caught before. And those are not cases that are going to go to prison right out of the chute when they're soliciting. The repeat buyers, uh, wow, wow. <laughs> After your picture's been in the paper and here we go again. Um, again, you can just imagine how many times that must happen then for each time that we catch them. And we actually had to talk to the legislature about public versus private arrangements to buy. Again, what the law was set up on was the idea that there would be a human being standing on a street corner down in the metro versus what goes on in reality of how this really happens. So there was actually a court of appeals case out of Candy, Ojai County, that talked about buying someone by ordering them up on your cell phone as a private event. So that can only be a misdemeanor versus a gross misdemeanor. We're like, you guys, we got to talk about this. When we went down to the legislature, actually, that was when the legislature was online. So as I'm sitting at my kitchen table talking to the legislature, um, there wasn't a constituency for the sex traffickers. We had uh, Republicans and Democrats and everybody all together on recognizing that we needed to update the laws. And they had some pretty candid questions that they asked us, and we gave them some pretty candid answers um, and did get the law updated in a lot of these areas. And also just the way that victims are handled in this situation. We basically set them side by side with domestic violence victims and got some of those same protections in place um, because we have found, including at Terebinth, when one of these women finally gets to the point, and they're not always women, but most, most times that's what we're seeing, um, they will literally go to Terebinth and give them a ride and say, let's, let's go. Um, and the idea that they could get out of the life and actually stay out of the life um, is not as simple as some people might think. The city of St. Cloud has been absolutely rock stars here. Um, as we know, we're not, let's, let's just be honest, we're not, we're not a community that's all about government regulation. We're just not. Um, when we decided to regulate, we're pretty darn good at it. The city of St. Cloud did a phenomenal job with writing some ordinances, with getting some things. All of a sudden, we had 15 massage parlors in our town, just suddenly. Really? Really? And those were the only things that we've actually found so far that were not coming from other places in Minnesota. Actually, the addresses that were coming back to those IP sites that what was going on there was actually from out of the country. Um, and that's the first and really only time that we've seen the stereotype of someone coming from a different place. It's all the rest has been here and has been local. But that's what this was. So the health inspectors, absolutely phenomenal uh, help. Going in there, they can go places that law enforcement can't for health regulations. And we did, in fact, um, find traffickers and victims in those places. And as soon as we found those victims and got them to a safe place, 
got them to where we could talk about it, poof, they were gone. So the reality of it is that prosecuting our way out of this is not going to be the only way we're going to be able to deal with it because the people who have been involved in the life, they're not just going to be able to walk out of it and testify. Not to say that they can't. And when we have to prove a sex act for money to prove sex trafficking, we've actually put Johns on the stand. If the victims were not in a position to say, here's what happened, well, the Johns were there. We caught them. And we have had Johns testify at the trials on the sex traffickers. This is just a cross-section of what some of these look like. Again, when we're seeing the sex traffickers, um, we're seeing people with significant criminal <laughs> histories that then are convicted of a very serious high-level crime. So the sentences that you're seeing here are more related to the criminal history and exactly what the crime was that we were able to prove at that time. Um, John Rasmussen, for example, had no criminal history at all. And the, the crime that we were able to prove that had a presumptive a Minnesota sentencing guideline sentence of 48 months, it doesn't mean that necessarily what he did at that place in time was different than what some of the rest of these people have done, but it all goes into, again, what have you been convicted of before? What can we prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you did now? And where do we go from there? Those electronic solicitation of a minor there in the bottom, those are those online chat rooms where literally you reel them in and they come to the door expecting that the person who's gonna open the door is gonna be a 15-year-old girl and instead it's law enforcement. And then the sexual assault of the juvenile victim who was contacted in that way um, is also one of the ones that we have there. This is the picture from the St. Cloud Times way back when we started. Um, and I think as we've talked about here before, I did try to talk the Times out of printing all those pictures because we had kids seeing dad's picture in the newspaper. We had employers. We had the neighbor lady. We had grandma. Um, I had a couple of very angry wives in my office asking for police reports. But from the perspective of the St. Cloud Times, no one would believe this was really happening until they saw somebody they knew. And um, it certainly did have that effect. Um, again, we had some also very negative effects from this, but the idea that the community um, wouldn't believe it until they actually saw it um, was certainly carried out in this, and they continue to... to uh, make those very public. So what we're asking people to look for, because everybody can look for this, um, and as Muriel talks about in the video, where we usually see the starting is as an older boyfriend. Um, hey, we're going to have a great life together, and you know, I'm just a little bit short on cash. If you could just help me out with this one thing, I'm going to set this up with this, this friend of mine. He won't hurt you. We just need to make rent. We need to be able to get some groceries. Then we take a picture, and then we're done. Um, that's what we're seeing. A lot of cash. If you're seeing, used to be the uh, little the hotel cards. All of a sudden, your teenagers got hotel cards that you're finding in their pocket. What might that be about? But because we've trained the hotels and the motels, now that's going out into apartments and private homes. So just a list of things to look for, not the only things that you might see. But that new possessions, and where, where, where are you getting this cash? And where are you getting, what do you mean you got your nails done? And now you got your hair colored, and now you have these things. Where, where did those come from? Truancy um, are high-risk runaways. Um, we see those through the child protection cases, and that's what we were told from the beginning. John Choi in Ramsey County said, we've got a 13-year-old from Stearns County. She's on your child protection caseload. Like, you, he was right. <laughs> we went, we looked, we got the name, we looked in, the, in that, and once you actually look, um, you can't unsee it. Um, what's going on with their cell phone? They're trying to hide it from you obviously the runaways, and just the sort of things that are offered to kids who are looking for a way out and who aren't cool and want an older, cool boyfriend, and one thing leads to another, and, um, and this is what we're seeing. So it's not that they're going to get snatched from the mall and kidnapped into a sex ring, not to say that that never happens. We've not seen that here yet. We're seeing this every single day. Um, and people doing this in broad daylight just down the street on their lunch break and on their way um, on their lunch from school, go home and turn a couple tricks and, and go back. So we did start with two full-time investigators, and we took the opportunity during the pandemic to apply for a third because we knew that we were going to have the charts and graphs and data to back up the demand, that we needed to work on demand, that we also needed to serve victims, and that we also wanted to catch and prove as many trafficking cases as we could. So these are the numbers of what we have. I do have the experts here today to answer questions that you might have about what we're actually seeing here, because I think that's the beauty of being able to show this to the community 
through the access that you have here as county board members and the fact that this is live streamed so that people can see what goes on out there. But we want to answer your questions. That's what I see the county board as the average person who gets to make decisions about what happens and who knows what's going on in the community. So we do invite your questions, and that's why I've got the experts here to answer them. So as those come up, I'll ask um, our experts that are in the audience here to come on up to the podium and answer your questions, um, whatever you have. Thanks, Janelle. I just have one question that popped up going through this. Did, did you see a change in patterns with COVID? I mean, a lot of people worked from home and weren't out working on the job I'm asked site. Trent to answer that because he was the one who was doing those investigations during that time. Uh, Investigator Trent Fisher, St. Cloud Police Department, he's been full-time doing this work since 2018. Morning. Morning. Um, so I got put back on patrol for a little bit, so there's a little bit of uh, lack of resources for us for a little bit, but the ads were still going. Um, it's just our ability to work the cases at that point, but it was still continuing on uh, like COVID really never happened, in my opinion. So it really didn't, the pattern stayed pretty consistent. It didn't see an uptick or downtick because people weren't traveling, people weren't owed. Correct, yeah, because most yeah. a lot of it's online ads and things like that. In fact, could you talk about how far people travel to Bisex? Uh, we have a lot of people that come, if they have a cabin up north, they might come from the metro. Mm -hmm. um, we've had people visiting from other countries that'll bisex in this area. Uh, we've had... You name it, just like I said in the video, you never know who's going to show up. It can be from all over the state. A lot of times they're not from our area that come in here because they think we're not doing it, maybe. Hmm. And the other thing I was thinking as this was going on is, you know, you keep talking about this cashless society. You know, how does this change? I mean, this is probably early thinking, but, you know, how does this change? You know, you got Venmo, you got all these different methodologies, but they're all traceable i'm presuming so you know as cash becomes like less prevalent i wonder how this changes the dynamics of some of this stuff it, it is always changing we uh sometimes we will get asked if we use or accept cash app if we're posing uh -huh. as for prostitution um so at some point i'm sure we're gonna have to you know develop something some way of of doing that um mostly it's still cash but yeah we do get requests where we get offered um an eBay card or some kind of credit, you know, something with okay. credit on it already. And that, and that in fact, yep. Okay. And the pictures in the video are all from real cases. Those are from our cases. Um, so you see the, the condoms and the cash and the ID and all the different things that we pick up in those cases. Anyone else have some questions? Tara? Uh, it's kind of a comment and a question. Um, Thinking about the teenagers, the victims, the, the young adults, and the lack really outside of Terebinth, think about at-risk teenagers. I mean, you talked about the number of kids who are being approached or at risk in many different ways. What resources do we really have for placements? And I'm sure there's work with our human services side, too. Um, the safe harbor. A, time, a long time ago, I worked with these kids. Yeah, I saw exactly. people who were trafficked and just horrible, horrible situations. And it was in a much larger area that actually did have crisis shelters, did have some other kinds of um, longer term opportunities for kids to figure out how to become more independent if they can't be at home. We don't really have some of those. So if you, I don't know if people are really starting to talk about what other kinds of resources might be necessary in this area. You've worked with Safe Harbor. Safe Harbor can take people in ways that other agencies can't. Yeah. 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 Kate LePage in the video is yep. she's really helpful in that regard. Um, like you said, 180 degrees. Um, we get a, they get a lot of youth from other areas too, you know, because there's right. a shortage in the state. Right. So a lot of times we may not have someone who, and, you know, they, it's not secure either. So there's issues there. But uh, when we need to place somebody, typically I go through Kate LePage just for her, you know, larger mm -hmm. um, ability to reach out for different areas of the state for resources right and mr. mr. chair um, and and what what's a challenge is now we've got somebody who's kind of in the thick of this it's the step backwards kids that are mm -hmm. having lots of crisis so very thankful for that resource if we're gonna have an opportunity to really help on that front end there's probably some additional things we might need to 
consider at some point, but it, it's a resource, so I know that. And center care um, on treatment beds, we actually had a situation where we had a victim who was ready to go into treatment. She was ready to, to take that step, and there wasn't a bed available, and the outcry that was created when that happened and how quickly everybody came together and said, we've been talking about this for so long, now we have this, and it didn't happen immediately. And then just the, the large amount of changes that happened at that moment because everybody understood what we were talking about and was able to, to fill that gap. So there has to be more than one way. Exactly. We're not going to be able Anyways. to prosecute our way out of this. Right. We have to tell people what's going on and how kids locally are getting recruited into the life so that we can stop that way before it gets to this point. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you all for your work. We're really, I think, pretty, it's, it's really a big deal that we have this incredible community interconnected group. And Commissioner Thursky, I'm glad you wandered in that one day <laughs> because I know what, a, what an advocate you've been. Mm -hmm. And because there are so many interconnected issues and challenges for the, on the victim side, you know, hopefully we can keep finding ways to, to be making a real difference in addition to the work you're doing. Because like you said, you can't prosecute your way through this. Anyone else have a comment? Janelle and her team? Commissioner Persky? Yeah, I'll, I'll just comment, although my voice is shot. And Janelle, uh, thank you for being here today and the other staff members as well. It's greatly appreciated. Um, and the, the video is well done. It's, it's real, um, it's sad, but it, it's ugly, but it's true. And when I was brought in about five years ago by accident and you said, come on in, and we've got a human trafficking meeting going on and I haven't left. Uh, and we still meet uh, monthly, usually a group anywhere from 20, even maybe 30 people. And we're there uh, <clears throat> because we're committed to do something. We're not gonna stop it, we know that. But we got to provide hope, hope for those women and, and individuals that are in it if they want to get out and also to prevent those folks that are vulnerable from getting in. So uh, it, it's, again, been a tremendous group committed to addressing these issues, and I hope we can just continue to do so. So thank you very much for being here today. And we have had our local and national legislators involved. Um, usually Congressman Emmer has one of his staff members that are there at those meetings. Um, Senator Putnam's been there. Um, uh, Representative Tice has been there, um, the school board. So we have people that are paying attention. I was actually a little worried about Commissioner Persky. We took him along to one of our very first trainings where you had a lot of survivors talking very candidly about what had happened. I remember the look on your face yeah. on just the reality of the human suffering that was going on here. But once you've seen that, you can't unsee it. And then the the commitment that we've had. So we have had... Um, wonderful reaction from our state legislator, um, again, from our from our member of Congress here. Um, and the funding that is going into this is because of the efforts of our legislators. So I also want to publicly thank them for the support that's been there and the money that has came and the resources. And at the end of the day, it's the connections that we have among each other, though, that are going to make that money really go to good use. So thank you to this board for approving those grant processes as we come down. That's in front of you every time. That will continue to happen. Right now, those three investigators are funded through 2023, and we're going to uh, keep up the good work and continue to keep our eye out for what more we can do. Thank you. Commissioner Lensmeyer. This is, uh, I can't remember if this is the fourth or fifth time I've seen uh, this video, uh, and I pick up something different from it every time. It is a ton of information to unpack, and... Uh, it's also a topic people, unfortunately, wish to ignore, but uh, that's not the way uh, to handle it. Uh, it's, a, you know, it's a miserable uh, thing to discuss, but people need to be aware of it. And uh, uh, also, uh, folks don't quite appreciate how uh, they can be uh, uh, eyes and ears in our society. Uh, the, uh, the old biblical adage of love thy neighbor uh, is uh, uh, appropriate in keeping your eyes open for whatever is happening uh, uh, in the area. The, uh, uh, 
the things that uh, the annual uh, <laughs> events, social events, uh, take place in neighborhoods in the summertime now, uh, getting folks together so that they look out for each other, get familiar with each other. I think in many ways, uh, it's easy to watch something like this get depressed, but in some ways, uh, society's going in the right direction and is that you just can't withdraw into your own little cubicle and hope things go okay. Well, they won't. You got to be involved. We have one other thing I want to bring to your attention and maybe ask Dr. Williams if we can put this on the website. Um, there are apps that you can get for your kid's phone oh. to know what's going on in your kid's phone, I'm saying. Um, shut it down, as Trent says in the video, after a certain amount of time at night. But we're going to put these, we'll put them on the, on the, in the back here so that people can grab them. But we do have ways that you can actively get involved in what's going on in that situation for your kids. Um, and you get to decide what you see and what you don't see and, and, and how you want to handle that. But parents are not powerless. You're not. I know it feels like that sometimes. I live through two teenagers in my house. And, and it, you know, what really goes on with kids during the day and on those phones and at the computers, um, there are ways that we can, we can be part of that. So we've got those here. Um, the investigators brought that back from one of the conferences that they were at, so we'll make that available as well. But as questions come, um, again, at the information on the end of that video is where you can find us. It's not usually a secret as to where you can find the sheriff and me and the chief of police. So um, we're all in this together. All those agencies are in it together. And there's no wrong place yeah. to call. If you, yeah. if you have information that you want to provide, um, 911 also works. There's the non-emergency numbers. Um, and please give us a chance to intervene because even if you think you see something, um, we check out every single one of those that has come through and there's been about 400 times that that's happened so far. So keep up the good work in, in giving us a chance to intervene. Thank you. Commissioner. Okay. Well, we had to wait a long time, but we finally got good news right at the end. <laughs> <laughs> there is something we can do. Yes, there is. All right. Thank, thank you, you for the much. time. Thank you very yes, much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Janelle. All right. All right. Do we need a break? Yes. Okay. <laughs> we'll take a five minute break.
All right. I'd like to call the board meeting back to order. And I guess our next item is administration. Yep, thank right. you, Mr. Chair. There's just one item here for you, and that is uh, to a resolution supporting Operation Green Light for veterans. And most of you heard about some of some about this yesterday at our district meeting, but um, this is uh, a, uh, a program that's supported by the National Association of Counties and the National Association of County Veteran Service Officers. And there, there are asking counties to uh, show appreciation and support to our veterans um, by adopting a resolution of support and by shining green lights uh, 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 on our buildings or in, in, in invite other governments to and private sector to to shine green lights um, in ways that they can um, and so that is going to show our veterans that we support them and that we appreciate them the second reason for um, the, the the resolution and the program is is to raise awareness about what we have as county veteran service officers and we have Corey here um, as, as resources available to support our veterans in, in many ways. And, and we all know that uh, Corey and his, his staff um, well know how to connect veterans to the, the, the benefits and the programs that, that they qualify for and have earned by their service to their country. Um, so the resolution is there. We are going to um, do um, a few things uh, with by green lighting um, were scheduled or planned as long as the board supports this. Um, we, we plan to have some flood green lights on the front of the courthouse steps that show up the columns. Um, uh, in this building, you see there's lights that face up and down um, in the front of this building, and those will be green. Um, and the downward shining lights at the law enforcement center will be green. And then um, I don't know that Kevin has quite figured out what we're going to do at the service center yet, but we're going to do something out there as well. And that'll happen, um, I think, I, I've got it here from, some, from the 7th to the 11th or whatever the dates are, it's in, in the package there. So um, that's what, that's what uh, that agenda item is, and hopefully the board will adopt the resolution and, and uh, we'll, we'll show our support to our veterans um, as NACO and the Association of Veteran Service Officers have suggested. Okay. Uh, Corey, did you want to, as long as you're here, say a few words or otherwise we can move forward? Sure. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Uh, I don't have a lot to say. I think this is an opportunity. It's a small gesture by the county, but a public gesture uh, to demonstrate uh, we do have Veterans Day coming up on November 11th. Uh, so the timing was not by accident. Uh, but uh, would appreciate your support. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Oh, Corey, sir, Corey, don't go, don't run away, <laughs> because <laughs> because we've got a number of veterans, you know, in the area. Obviously, you're aware of that. But if they got questions, what's the best way to to get those questions answered? Give us a call. Our county veteran service office phone number is three two zero six five six six one seven six. We are. Uh, we do encourage veterans. Every county in the state of Minnesota has a county veteran service officer, and so we'd encourage you to reach out to your respective county veteran service officer. If you live in Stearns County, give us a call. Okay. And if they're from East St. Cloud or Sauk Rapids, that you can give them the number they should be calling. I don't have that number, but, but yes, they, they, our front desk would absolutely. Can give it to them. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. Yep. Sure. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Lenzweyer. Uh, uh, I'm going to do some... Uh, bragging here uh when we hired corey uh for veteran services officer uh, he was up against one west point graduate and and uh also uh one other fellow that was an officer and had achieved significant rank and eventually was hired, I think, by Benton County. But long story short, uh, that wasn't Corey's background. Corey was a non-commissioned officer, sergeant level down. And uh, while I don't know uh, 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 veterans' uh, situations, in great detail, listening to my brothers and my brother-in-laws and extended family 
folks that had been in the military. Uh, okay, you know, we all, no matter what our work situations, almost make a science out of bitching about our bosses. But uh, some of the uh, comments that these were all, none of my, my family uh, were at the officer level. And it was important for me that we hired someone who could relate. Okay, if you're one, one uh, the, the West Point graduate interview was particularly frustrating because he had his West Point ring on, and during the interview he kept wrapping it, wrapping it on the desktop. And uh, I, I just couldn't see those two relating to veterans that I knew, like, you know. Uh, and so uh, uh, Corey was the guy that came from reality world. Uh, I could see him being able to uh, talk through these situations better than the other two, even though on paper we would have looked really cool getting these highly, otherwise highly qualified individuals to do this job. So uh, uh, I don't know what the experience is in other county boards hiring uh, uh, veteran services officers, but uh, that was a huge factor in my vote, and I usually don't go to bat for individual uh, candidates after after interviews, but I did in this case, and it has made a difference. Uh, I'm I, when I hear feedback on Corey's office, uh, the positive feedback. And I'm going to rely on Jeff uh, on this aspect too. The positive feedback I hear is from people I don't expect it from. And Jeff, uh, you have more military experience than the rest of us put together. Uh, what's your take on it? I think Corey is doing an excellent job. Huh? I think Corey's doing an excellent job. In fact, I just contacted him last week or the week before about an issue going on from 60 years ago, and he's working on it. So, the uh, it is well, the, the job quality is there, but did would we have? Is there a, 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 a communication gap depending upon the military experience of the individual? Are there people that would that have an advantage in terms of uh, communicating with uh, uh, folks that he might have that others wouldn't? What would you do? What would you say? I don't know. Just from an outside perspective, from what I see. Some of Corey's biggest challenges might be dealing with the actual veterans hospital and trying to coordinate things mm -hmm. there. I don't know, maybe Corey wants to comment on that a little bit. Sure, and first, thank you for your compliments. I hope I can live up to them <laughs> over time. <laughs> well, you're still here, so. Uh... <laughs> uh, well, we do strive, quickly, we do strive to do the best service, and something I discuss with our staff is we do as much as we can with the time and the resources that mm -hmm. we have. Uh, but that doesn't always mean we're able to do everything. And at the end of the day, the facts that in each individual case are what end up resulting in a grant or a denial or, or achieving the benefit that we're looking for. But we will do everything we can or that we're able to, to accomplish that. Uh, certainly coordinating issues with the VA hospital uh, sometimes that's an, that, that is an issue. I don't know if that's the predominant, you know, disability compensation claims, pension claims, and ancillary benefits tied to that are probably the bulk of the work that we do uh, and assist clients with. Um, and then, you know, there are issues, um, I would say, at, for myself as a VSO with my hat on as a liaison to the VA, that is a common issue as we're working on, you know, process issues or uh, things like, access to long-term care through the VA and so forth. But uh, thank you very much for your compliments. Corey, I know one other thing. The VA, like everybody else right now, is having um, employee problems as far as not enough employees. And I don't know, has that complicated your situation at all lately or not? Uh, we, 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 not so much complicated it, although we've seen that come up 
more frequently. Um, there's we're limited in what we can do, you know, in, in talking to the VA. And I think in my conversations with the VA, they they don't want these types of problems either. They would like to have the staff and the services available, if that was possible. Thank Mr. you. Chair? Yes. Um, I want to make a motion to approve the resolution, just so we get that on the table. Want to thank you and your staff for the ongoing work and all the work together with the community. Uh, stand down was this past week and. As usual, a great success. And uh, like some others, I serve on the NACA, our National Association Veteran and Veterans Family Committee, and they sent um, us a green light bulb. So we actually have one outside our house. I'm wondering, is a, another something for administration to consider? Perhaps for that week, we could actually post something on the doors to telling people how they can contact Veteran Services, um, just just as another visible way that it's. Not just the green light but that we're actually offering services. And yours you is me. not a quiet constituency group. <laughs> Boy, is that polite. Anyway, uh, uh, and the fact that I don't get feedback speaks volumes. I'll second the motion. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Mergen. Uh, any further discussion? The resolution's in front of us. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of saying five is saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. All right. Our last item is issues by commissioners. Commissioner Mergen? I'll pass today. Commissioner Lensmeyer? I know nothing. <laughs> Commissioner Persky? Uh, a couple couple things. Uh, first of all, I was quite pleased uh, with uh, Janelle's presentation uh, today uh, and uh, the, uh, the support that we've had from the board uh, in addressing human trafficking. Uh, just to mention there are are going to be continuing funds available at the state and federal level to help support that. So I, I hope we can continue that effort um, throughout the next few years and, 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 uh, and moving forward. Also want to say um, I appreciate those folks that were here today uh, in support of the good job. I think that, uh, uh, Randy, you're doing in your office as far as election uh, opportunities and election security. We have the vote coming up be before our next meeting. So. Um, we will have the results and again hoping things will go well and I, I can only suspect that if it's as it was in the past it will go well uh, and one last thing it's deer hunting season will happen between now and the next meeting too and so people be safe out there um, there are more important things than shooting a deer out there not many but <laughs> <laughs> for those hunters that, that that thinks it's the only thing be careful because uh, it, it can be a very great experience in our heritage but also we need to be safe did you get fiber to your stand yet? I, no, I haven't. I haven't <laughs> shot a deer yet. So <laughs> I'm working on that. Okay. Commissioner Clark? I was going to say, I don't think it counts, but my husband's uh, uh, car got sideswiped by a deer recently, and the deer managed to uh, break a window, among other things. But I think both the, both uh, my husband and uh, the deer survived. Uh, so oh. Not sure exactly what we take away from all of this, except for being careful and safe, not just when you're hunting, because we have a lot of deer around, and certainly do want to encourage people to make sure they get out and do not just our constitutional right, but their civic duty and vote. And lastly, Halloween is next Monday, and oh. we should also all yes. be careful with all the little children running around on our streets that night, and you know, hopefully help them be safe yes. by driving safe. Yeah. All right. With that, uh, if administration has nothing else, yes, we will adjourn. Thank you. Thank you.